Hey cat, see so you made it to Wally's Wattage Cottage. I'm Wally. I've decided that I want to pass on some of the knowledge and experience that I've gained working on tube, guitar, bass, and amplifiers, and other electronics over the past several years. To start off the series tonight, we're going to do a little bit of a teaser to give you an idea of what I plan on doing over the next several videos. Right now I have lined up a uh, a music man that I'm probably going to do first. I've got a Vox AC30 waiting to be fixed. A couple of stereo choruses that are solid state rather than tube. And vintage magnetones that are ready to be rebuilt. I've got a lot of things around here. Every once in a while I plan on throwing in a basic electrical instruction. We'll talk about voltage and resistance and impedance and inductance and reactance over the next few weeks. I'm really looking forward to doing this. I love teaching people how to do things, and there's nobody here in person that's really interested, so maybe some people will get a little bit out of this. Tonight, I'm going to do triage on a few different amplifiers. Now, what I mean by triage is I'm going to, instead of actually diagnosing and repairing them, I'm going to take a quick look at them so I have an idea ahead of time of how much time I'm going to have invested in each one. It allows me to prioritize. Basically, I have three kinds of customers. Uh, the first would be players. Players need their equipment back right away. Um, if they need it, sometimes I'll turn it around and fix it while they wait, if they need it for a, for a gig. The other kind I have are commercial customers. Uh, one of the major music store chains, I fix all of their vintage stuff in the area that I live in, and a large equipment rental company, I do all of their stuff. And that stuff varies in time depending upon whether customers are waiting, whether there's a big music festival coming up in the weekend, and that's how that gets prioritized. And then there are collectors, and collectors usually wait the very longest time. I mean, frankly, there's really no way to make a living restoring vintage amps at all. Uh, if I charged how many hours it really took, the cost of repairs would probably be more than the amps are actually worth. So. The first thing I'm going to do is start throwing some amps up on the bench here and take a quick look, do some measurements, and get an idea of what's going to be required to fix the amps. First amp I'm going to triage is this nice. Every technician's nightmare is when somebody brings you an amplifier that they've already taken apart. I mean, here's a bad output transformer. Apparently, I haven't tested it yet to make sure. And this is a Music Man, and I think, from what I understand, a few different people have tried to work on this thing. Uh, maybe another amp technician, from what I've heard. And the Music Man amps basically come in two major configurations. Uh, all Music Man amps are part solid state and part tube. Now, the two configurations are that some have MOSFET driven output tubes and some use a phase inverter to drive the output tubes and we can explain that at some point in the future and this one here looks like I'm going to guess that this is a standard phase inverter driven amplifier which probably is really good news because if it's been messed with and has a blown output transformer if it were a MOSFET driven music man pretty much the whole output section probably would be blown out of it. So I'm going to take a look at this thing quickly here. Somebody has put in a output, new output transformer. Looks like a Mojo. Uh, the wires are hanging all over and uh, this is going to take a little bit to get through. So for right now there's really nothing for me to order for this or anything. I'm not even going to put electricity to it yet. I will in a little while. But basically, like I said, this is pretty much every technician's worst nightmare getting something that somebody else has messed with. We take a look inside though, I want to point out something. That all of these little things that are little round metal things, those are very old style integrated circuits. Uh, each one of them I think probably has eight wires coming out of it. And what's interesting is they're socketed, which means that they're made so they can be replaced. That didn't last very long. Eventually they found out ICs were pretty dependable and they went to non-socketed ICs. But again, I'll look forward to taking a look at this in a little while. We'll plug it in and see what exactly is going on with it. But for right now, I want to take and evaluate a couple of other amplifiers before I go any further. 
The next one I'm going to take a quick look at is a Box AC15. Where was this one made? Aha, this is a real British. Made in England AC15. They're usually pretty good sounding amps. This one, I have a customer complaint that the first jack is bad in it. Doesn't work anymore. And that's probably fairly common. Uh, these use plastic cliff jacks and they don't have a whole lot of durability when they get pulled on a lot on stage. So we'll take a look and open this up in a minute. Um, the first thing I'm going to do to triage it though is I'm actually going to plug it in, fire it up, and see what kind of sound it makes and if it's making any other weird noises or anything. One of the things I do with any amp when I first get it is when I first plug it in, I never plug it in directly to power. I plug it in through a series current limiter so that if the amp is shorted or has any other problems it won't cause any further problems by me plugging it in. Besides that, frankly, fuses are relatively expensive and therefore the first thing I always do is plug into a series limiter and I'll explain that in a little while. And then when I turn on the amp I keep an eye on the limiter and see how brightly it lights as to whether the amp has a problem or not. So right now I'm going to turn on this AC15 and the pilot light came on and the 150 watt series bulb that I use didn't light up at all. So, so far so good. I'll let it warm up a few minutes. This amp has a tube rectifier so it won't draw any current when you throw it out of standby unless the rectifier tube has warmed up. You can see we have a tiny bit of glow in the series light when I click on the amp. And that looks about normal. So what I'm going to do now is put it back into standby and plug it into regular voltage. Take it out of standby again. Okay, the first input pot's a little noisy, no big deal. I notice in this amp the user has all the cool little little green dots where they set it. They don't use reverb, they don't use tremolo. Amp sounds real quiet and everything. Except for one noisy pot. So, for me the best way to test amplifiers when I first test them was with a guitar. And then after that we can put them on the scope and check stuff out. So I'm going to go grab a guitar. So, I went and grabbed my trusty test guitar that I use most of the time. This is a genuine S101. Bought this baby new on eBay for 60 bucks. It was the Christmas Eve day and nobody was bidding when I closed on it. Um, I refinished the neck on it. Had a bad neck joint. I revarnished it and finished it. And Anyway, it's not a great guitar. I have some great guitars, but this one's good to leave out to test amps because it's got a humbucker on the bottom and single coils and then a humbucking setting so I can check all different kinds of guitar outputs in the amps. Let's give this box a try and see how it works. Sounds an awful lot like a uh, Vox. So that was the second input. It works fine. The amp sounds good. Let's see. Tremolo works. Cool. And what about reverb? The reverb's kicking in and out. So that's one of the things I'll put in my notes that I have to take a look at. And so it looks like, as the customer said, we've got a broken, we've got a bad input jack, and from what it sounds like. It's probably mounted right to a circuit board, I'm just guessing, and it probably broke off the circuit board. That's a really common thing in the Fender Hot Rod series too. Luckily it's relatively easy to fix. If it's a player's amp like this one is, uh, a lot of times I just take and run wires so that we don't have to worry about it breaking off the circuit board again. But we'll come back to this one later. I'm going to put in my notes. It looks like all it needs is an input jack, and we'll go through the normal tune-up stuff with cleaning sockets and so forth. I'm going to go grab another one. Now the next one that got me out of breath hauling it is a stereo chorus. It's a Roland Jazz Chorus, rather. 
The Roland Jazz Course has been made for a lot of years in a lot of different configurations. This one is marked that it has no reverb. Let's give it a try and see what we can find out. Once again, when I first turn it on, I have it plugged into my series limiter to see whether it has any shorts or anything, which it doesn't, but the amp is making an awful lot of noise start up. Unfortunately, this is relatively common for old choruses. We're going to have to go through and check a lot of solder joints in that and find out why it's doing this. As far as the amp goes, we'll do a real quick sound check so I can take notes on what all needs to be addressed. In the channel one. It sounds like it's supposed to in channel one. Pots aren't dirty or anything. Both outputs work. Go to channel two. And as they said, there's no reverb. On most amps, the reverb tank is mounted somewhere else inside the cabinet. On these choruses, the reverb tank is actually a tiny tank that's mounted on the chassis, so you can't just put any reverb tank in these. So before I order one, I'm gonna have to open this up and find out whether it's a connection problem or a reverb problem. And again, I'm going to come back into it because tonight is just getting these checked out to make sure I've verified what's wrong with them. There's nothing like the chorus of a Roland Jazz Chorus. So, bottom line is on this one, we'll come back to it. We're going to have to find out why the reverb's not working. It probably needs a tank. Jazz courses are heavy for old guys. Anyway, I've got another jazz course here. This one's marked as this one's marked as having no chorus. That's really sad when you have a rolling jazz course with no chorus. So let's take a look at what this one's doing. It turns on okay. It did not make our bulb light, so we're in good shape as far as power draw goes. So first, same as the other jazz chorus, we're going to check both channels one at a time and see how they're doing. Sounds pretty snappy. I'm telling you what, people always talk about tube amps, but for super crisp, clean sound, some of the solid states can't be beat. Let's check out our other channel. Well, we definitely have reverb. Grab a pick here. Wow. Amazingly loud, too. The reverb's working. Well, you can hear right now, this is one of the reasons we check everything so carefully. This came in with non-working chorus. The chorus is working right now. So, I suspect that we're going to find a problem in one of the switching circuits that's intermittent. So, um, I'm actually going to open this one up first, and that'll be the next thing that we take a look at. For now, I wanted to give you a little preview of where I plan on going with this channel. Wanted to test out my equipment, see how the lighting works, the sound and everything. And next time we see each other, I'll open up this course and we'll find out why the course was intermittent. Thanks. 
Feel free in the comments to leave any suggestions you want for what you want to see me work on and fix. I have vintage Gibsons, Magnetones, SVTs, uh, old Fender, Super Reverbs, Champs. Uh, I've got some beautiful uh, 63 Vibrolux. There's a lot of stuff here to rebuild. And the order that I'll do it in, other than the repairs I have to get done for people, you can kind of guide me in what you want to see me rebuild and restore. Look forward to seeing you soon. Come on back to the Wattage Cottage.